The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's webinar on sexual wellness and the uh, pharmaceutical compounding treatment strategies for this. Um, I want to thank you for your time, uh, for being here. I want to be respectful of it. I do want to cover a lot of material, but I want to rush through it. So um, I do want to get into it. But before I do, just to introduce myself a little bit. My name is Dr. Campbell. I'm a pharmacist here with Wells Pharmacy, and I've been compounding for the better part of 15 years, um, sterile and non-sterile products, um, to include everything under the sun, uh, lyophilized products, sterile products, non-sterile products, hormone products, and everything in between. So um, tonight's webinar, of course, is on sexual wellness. We're going to be focusing on medications and the pharmacal uh, management of uh, erectile dysfunction and female sexual disorder. So, We'll just get right to it. And um, before I do, I want to tell you what I'm going to talk about. So we're going to discuss some of the epidemiology and some of the prevalence of erectile dysfunction, also touching on some female sexual uh, arousal disorders. And then just give a brief overview regarding some of the pathophysiology and the physical causes behind some of these disorders, any risk factors that may be contributing to it or medications that may be contributing to it. And then, of course, most importantly, we want to present the pharmacologic uh, treatment options, specifically compounded treatment options. Uh, this will include oral, injectable, uh, and some topical uh, applications. So to get right into it, right, so this is a picture that may be uh, unfortunately too common. Um, you know, it, the, it, the it's not you, it's me thing, right? So the, the women ends up feeling insecure. When a male experiences erectile dysfunction, she might feel uh, inadequate in, in some way. Of course, the male goes through a lot of thought processes in himself, wondering what's going on, why is this happening to me? And they're both kind of at a loss, and they're both frustrated um, sometimes for different reasons. But we do find in a number of studies that the incidence of erectile dysfunction doesn't vary very often between races. It's, it's, it's pretty straightforward, pretty common um, among all different races. Um, it does have an increased incidence, however, with age, uh, of course, diabetes, uh, hypertension, and then some moderate or severe lower urinary tract um, symptoms. So um, decreased incidence they found in this particular study with exercise, um, meaning that with more exercise, it's less prevalent, um, and then college education versus less than high school. So it's more prevalent in less than high school um, education in this particular study. Again, there's even a, a much larger study that was done um, by the National Health and Nutrition Examination. This is a survey done of 18 million men um, over the age of 20. And this was an interesting study because it did include um, some younger men. Normally we see erectile dysfunction in uh, men that are in their 40s and 50s and over. Uh, this did include some younger men. It was done in 2001, 2002. And they were asked a question if they were uh, never able or sometimes able to get and keep an erection that was satisfactory for intercourse. So what they found is that 90% of these people that um, did have erectile dysfunction, they also had more than one cardiovascular risk factor, most of them with diabetes. Of course, this is a microvascular disease, so those small, um, uh, those small blood vessels are kind of the first to get affected by this. There was incidents with uh, hypertension, dyslipidemia, and um, some smoking. Uh, they did find in this particular study that was significantly associated with diabetes, also lower education as well as decreased physical activity. So it coincided with the results of the previous study. This one final one, this was probably one of the best known and one of the longest time-spanning studies. It started in 1987 through 1989 and then picked up again in 1995 through 1997. And what this looked for is not just the, um, the incidence of it, but the in incidence of, um, of new cases in males that didn't have it and then did um, have some form of erectile dysfunction. So the overall rate being about 50%. Again, increased risk associated with all the disease um, states that we see here. Um, Increased incidence with treatment, meaning that if you're being treated for diabetes or hypertension, that the prevalence of erectile dysfunction went up. So this shows that there's um, a pharmacologic connection in some patients who um, are being treated for those disease states. They do contribute 
to new cases of erectile dysfunction. Again, um, lower education, and this one was interesting with decreased income, it was a higher prevalence. So all this to say that it's a very, um, very prevalent uh, disease state. Um, over 30 million men in the U.S. with some form of erectile dysfunction. These are typically the disease states, um, some of the physical um, traits that some men have. Um, and even over on the, on the far right, you'll see some of these unhealthy lifestyle habits. And those are important because those are some of the uh, non-pharmacologic non uh, therapies that can be used, um, at least addressed first, um, to treat erectile dysfunction before jumping into um, throwing more medicine at them. So, um, of course, you want to do look at the medications that they're taking, and we're going to look at those in a little bit, but um, keep in mind those things on the far right, they can contribute to that. And um, if you're looking at treating something without uh, throwing another prescription at them, then, you know, those are some of the things to, to think about treating. So there's basically five different forms of erectile dysfunction. Um, the one we're going to talk about a little bit is the uh, medication-induced um, erectile dysfunction. These include the drug class of antihypertensive, antidepressants, some NSAIDs, and uh, even some antihistamines um, just a little bit. So the next here is, uh, you know, female sexual dysfunction. Um, this is a, I want to say new area, but is is becoming a little bit more talked about and becoming more prevalent. Um, it's defined as a persistent or recurrent problem with sexual response, desire, orgasm, or pain that distresses you or puts a strain on your relationship. Now, sexual pain disorder is, of course, any genital pain associated with intercourse. Arousal disorder, that's going to be an inability to att uh, attain or maintain uh, adequate lubrication or swelling. Uh, orgasmic disorder is, of course, um, delay or ab ab absence of orgasm. And then the sexual desire disorder is just a low interest or desire or avoiding any contact, uh, you know, genital contact with your partner. So the important thing with this picture is it, if somebody presents with um, female sexual dysfunction and, and they complain of low libido, it may be uh, not just treating low libido. There's other factors that overlap that that you might want to consider um, you know, treating. You, you can't just treat one aspect of it. You would treat the whole, uh, the whole picture. Uh, the low libido may be um, you know, a, um, an overlap from um, from pain that they have, um, may experience during intercourse, so or um, just the lack of pleasure, so they don't have a they have a lack of arousal, so it's all kind of intertwined there. Of course, the sexual response in the female is very complex and um, uh, has a lot of different variables that have to be considered. So, the disruption of any one component would disrupt some of the other ones. Now this website at the bottom here, um, I get asked this a lot: is you know, how do you talk about uh, female sexual dysfunction with a with a female? A lot of male physicians, um, you know, aren't comfortable asking women about their 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 sex life or their um, intensity of orgasm or you know their lubrication and things of that nature. And some of the women aren't um, women patients aren't comfortable talking about that. So this website has a couple PDF files that you can download and make copies of and and give to your patients. They can fill them out um, at their leisure in private. Um, and then there's also a key that goes with that, and then you can score them and you can better understand this. So um, that's just a, a little useful information if you're looking to, um, uh, you know, find a way to communicate uh, female sexual dysfunction with some of your patients that otherwise may be hesitant. So <clears throat> Just to bring up more uh, statistics on the prevalence of female sexual dysfunction, this was, a, um, this was done about 10 years ago or so, and um, they did find that the highest prevalence of the low sexual desire in this particular group of patients was that the older women who are menopausal, um, they're white or Hispanic, they had an elevated BMI index, and they were on some antidepressant medications. All this to say that it you know, that there's about 40 million women, according to the study, that has some form of female sexual dysfunction. Um, study done here, of course, there's 1,700 women in this study, ranging from 18 to 60 years old about, and just indicating that there's about 40% of these women who indicate some form of uh, sexual dysfunction. Some of the predictors for that are emotional or marital problems, um, even the education level indicated in this study. 
And the other one here, just the last one here, just to touch up, that this is just to indicate that there's approximately 60% of the general population less than 60 years old that do have some form of degree of sexual dysfunction. Now, the point of all this isn't the numerical facts and data that get hung up on all that, but rather it's just to indicate that it is an alarmingly prevalent issue that may be underreported and certainly an opportunity for physician intervention for treatment. So some of this drug-induced dysfunction, this, um, this mainly goes with erectile dysfunction. There's a lot of um, literature out there indicating um, antipsychotics and depressants have a, have a detrimental effect on erectile dysfunction. Um, the chronic use of NSAIDs with regular use, they do find that um, there's a little higher incidence of uh, erectile dysfunction in, this, in these patients. There was a study done on this one, and um, I believe it was about five years ago. Um, of 80,000 men, and they did find that um, ED was well beyond what would be expected uh, due to their age after they factored out all those um, comorbidities. Antihypertensive of, uh, medications, of course, um, just by the nature of dilating the blood vessels, are going to have uh, some effect on erectile function. Proton pump inhibitors. Um, there's plenty of literature out there indicating this, that um, it can lead to an increase of an enzyme called ADMA, which is basically going to inhibit nitric oxide production, which is uh, essential in uh, getting and maintaining an erection. And then again, the H2 receptor antagonist, this one specifically really is just geared toward more cementidine. Um, if patients are on this medication, uh, they do find that there's a higher incidence of erectile dysfunction as opposed to other medications in this class. So we're going to get right to the compounded medications. Um, so sildenafil, of course, was the first to come out. You know, um, this was very, very popular. Um, and then vardenafil was another option. So there's not a whole lot of difference between any of these um, PD-5 inhibitors. They're all going to be equally effective. If, you, if you're not familiar with these medications, um, they do take about um, an hour to, for, for onset. Sodalafil, maybe two hours. Uh, Sodenafil, Vardenafil has a half-life of about four hours, whereas Tadalafil, um, about 18 hours. So they're all going to cause flushing, uh, headache, congestion, maybe some dyspepsia. Some of the visual disturbances only happens with um, Sodenafil and Vardenafil not so much with um, Tadalafil, and that's because there's um, some crossover reaction with phosphodiesterase 6, which is in the, in the retina in the eye. So these are not going to be effective for all erectile dysfunction patients. Um, there's going to be a lot of modifiable, uh, modifiable factors to be considered with the timing, some of the food interactions, uh, decreased um, adequate stimulation, maybe the use of alcohol, things of that nature, patient relationship, of course, so we can, com we can compound sildenafil um, combined with oxytocin. Um, so you say, why oxytocin? So it's one of the many neurotransmitters that we find um, that are involved in controlling erections. And there's been several studies that have indicated that oxytocin is a key role in the central regulation of penile erection. It's also released by the pituitary at the time of orgasm, and it mediates contractility in the, in the epididymis. So this is all to say that it's uh, oxytocin does have some benefit uh, delivered, of course, sublingually, not so much orally, as it is degraded by chymotrypsin in the gut. So we want to deliver these medications sublingually. But all this to say that oxytocin can play a benefit in maintaining and getting an erection as well as um, contractility uh, experienced during orgasm. So sildenafil sublingually is going to be pretty bitter. Um, it's not a water-soluble product, so we do have to make it as a tablet um, that, to, that is to be swallowed. Um, it can be, uh, so combining it with oxytocin in a tablet wouldn't really be the way to go for that, but it can be combined um, with the gelatin-based trochee that the patient can place under their tongue. It can be a little bit bitter to hold under the tongue as it dissolves, but um, you know, if that's your option, then um, it's, not, it's not a very popular one. Most patients are going to use the Tadalafil compound, which can be used um, a little bit better absorbed sublingually, and that has a lot to do with the molecular weight, of course, of Tadalafil. For most drugs to be absorbed uh, sublingually, molecular weight does play a significant role in that. So 
We can compound tadalafil with oxytocin. With um, we can also we've had paroxetine added before in the daily dose of tadalafil um, for the purposes of um, uh, premature ejaculation. So a, a low dose of paroxetine, about five milligrams, is is, uh, is uh, has been shown to be very useful for that. We uh, we can compound it with other things like arginine or testosterone. So these are made as little mini trochies, um, about the size of a very very small tablet, placed under the tongue. They dissolve. Uh, in, in a couple minutes, or gelatin trochies, a little bit larger square trochies, uh, capsules, or chewable tablets. This is um, it's not very it's not as bitter, nearly as bitter as sildenafil, um, so it's a little bit easier to um, to hold in the mouth there. So, vardenafil, I'll just touch on this just a little bit, mostly because um, it's probably not a good choice for your elderly patients. Um, it does have some um, QT interval prolongation. Um, effects. So with the patient with a lot of these other comorbid disease states, um, you know, you don't really want to give a medication that may um, have, a, have a cardiac effect. So, but in, the, in your younger patients um, who are otherwise healthy, who, um, who are just looking either to um, get a little bump, this would be a great choice. Um, it has a very relatively short uh, duration of action and, and a relatively quick onset. These are made as uh, some lingual tablets. They're little uh, trochies that can be placed sublingually. It's very water soluble and it's not bitter um, at, at, at all. So, of the three, it's probably the the most pleasant um, you know medication to hold under the tongue orally. And then finally, just um, in the event that the patient is not responding at all to any dosage of an oral medication. Um, we do reserve these for some ICPs. Uh, these are injections that are injected um, as a as a liquid, as a solution, and they can contain uh, multiple ingredients or sometimes just a single ingredient uh, into the side of the penis, into the caver uh, corpus cavernosum there, and the spongy tissue that you see in the picture. So normally these are injected again at the two or ten o'clock position, just enough to get in there, not deep enough to go, of course, to the urethra. You're going to cause some uh, pretty severe pain there. So these are compounds um, that we mix with um, papaverine, phentolamine. We call those a bimix. There's papaverine, phentolamine, and then alprostadil in those patients who may be non-responsive to bimix. So um, and then of course you can just give alprostadil alone. But um, two major side effects of these injections are going to be priapism, of course. If you overdose them, um, it can easily cause priapism, so you have to be very, very precise and careful on, on the, your dosage selection. And then uh, the fibrosis, of course, is with the papaverine. So as your concentration of papaverine goes up, your incidence maybe of uh, fibrosis would occur, meaning that there's going to be some, um, some scarring there. Um, typically, this, isn't, this is with chronic use over the course of you know, years. Um, which is going to lead to some, some plaque formation. So to prevent that fibrosis or that plaque formation from uh, beginning, what we want to do is after you inject this, just compress the area for three or four minutes and just um, hold it there. And that does um, deter the formation of some of that fibrotic condition. So these are to be injected no more than once every 24 hours or no more than three times per week. Now they do cause uh, significant erection in almost 80, 90 percent, almost 100 percent of users. Um, there have been cases where the patient will claim uh, it didn't work for them, um, even when they're using a significant dose. And that's, that's usually a problem of uh, not being injected correctly or just not using the right uh, concentration or, or volume. So what will I get into? Um, of course, we just we don't want to limit uh, what you're going to do with these medications, but we do want to show you some of the more common things that we make. So alprostadil is normally 20 to uh, 40 micrograms per mil. This is in a multi -dose, multiple dose vial, uh, either 5 or 10 mils. Bimix, again, is papaverine and phentolamine at 30 milligrams or 1 milligram per mil. Now that can be increased um, if needed, but 30 one is what we call it. That's um, very common and, and works for most people. So, for the people that are not responsive to bimix, we also have trimix, and these are the uh, some of the most common ones that we use. So, if a patient has never 
uh, used um, an ICP, we generally want to start them at the lowest effective dose, right? We don't want to overshoot and um, you know give them too much too concentration. Um, so we start out at at the lower dose that you see there, and kind of gradually work up. Um, now the amount that you inject is going to typically start as low as 0 0.1, um, 0 0.1 mils, but generally around 0 0.2, 0 0.25 mils, and then work up um, by 0 0.1 mil increments um, until you get the response that you're that you're looking for. So um, uh, many times it's not necessary to start at the lowest dose, uh, especially when you have a patient who has a history of multiple disease states, multiple um, uh, risk factors, or um, has a history of uh, you know, surgery, prostate surgery, you probably, they're probably going to need maybe a 3220 um, or above to have any effect. So these are solutions, and they're very stable. The, 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 the bimix, uh, meaning the papaverine and photolamine, is very stable at room temperature. It does not require refrigeration. When you add the alprosidil, um, that's when things have to be kept cold um, and or frozen. So it can be kept refrigerated um, about two months before it falls below that 90% threshold. Um, it's still going to be effective beyond that, but uh, we do have a, a BUD on the label of a little bit less than two months. The patients can uh, keep their vials frozen and it will maintain its potency um, for up to six months. So the patient will have to thaw out the medication and then draw it up into their syringe and then keep the medication back in the freezer. And now this does retain stability with multiple freeze-thaw cycling, so, um, and this is in a, a journal article where they tested the potency of this after multiple freeze-thaw sessions and again it does, it does not degrade the product uh, with multiple use. So these are just some examples I want to touch on. So, People will generally come in and um, they'll start out and they'll get something kind of like this. They'll start out with a daily Tadalafil. Of course, we know that's effective, right? So at five milligrams, we combine it also with oxytocin. These are rapid dissolved tablets um, or uh, trochies. You can get them in any kind of one of the forms that were mentioned in the previous slides. And um, those are held under the tongue just for they dissolve pretty rapidly in less than a couple minutes. Um, the patients will take those daily. They might get some arginine or citrulline capsules just as an adjunct um, therapy, just to add on there. And then, uh, you know, just as an add-on, maybe you might consider just giving them uh, a, a few of the, the full strength just as an as a extra bump um, if they need it or, or maybe want it. And then this low-dose naltrexone um, will have some effect on um, on erectile function as well. So this is kind of what we would kind of start out at. Now if a patient is non-responsive to any oral therapy and they have a history of being non-responsive to it, you don't really want to start here. You might want to start with something like this where you can give a, a, a sublingual form of oxytocin, um, again with just some arginine, citrulline to as an adjunct. Uh, it may or may not have you know, great effect, but it's, um, it's certainly something you can add in there. And this would include maybe also adding um, a, a form of trimix or bimix or even an alprostadil. Uh, this, these are just examples. This isn't um, anything set that you have to use or go in this format. This is just suggestions um, that you would do. So uh, again, if you order trimix injection, you'd also need to order syringes, uh, administration ne uh, needles and alcohol swabs, and um, we can supply those as, as well. The typical needle that's used is you're going to be your 31 gauge, um, 5 sixteenths inch or 8 millimeter, and it's going to be a half to one mil syringe depending on the dose that you're giving to the patient. You can also choose to use a syringe auto injector where the patient doesn't have to um, you push the plunger down themselves. They just kind of press it against there and it automatically injects their volume. And that's an option as well. Um, we do have, um, in the past, we've had some users use a, a 30 gauge um, needle that's a half inch long. And while that can be effective, if the patient is very careful, um, it can be used. Um, the downside of that is sometimes the patient will push the needle all the way in and then continue pushing, and the needle will penetrate the urethra. And um, of course, it's very painful, and then they'll call you 
saying that it's really painful and it didn't work. So we try to keep the needle length short just enough to get into that, that spongy tissue and the corpus cavernosum and that's where the medication needs to be delivered. So these again, just, uh, uh, just to review, these are some of the most common uh, Trimix formulations that are um, available and uh, kept in stock and ready to go. Um, you may or may not want to try Bimix first. Um, the downside of Trimix, if there was one, would be that um, as you increase the concentration of the alprostadil, you do, there may be a, a little burning uh, sensation that the, that the user may feel. And this will usually subside within uh, two to three minutes. But, um, you know, depending on the patient's tolerance for pain or um, what they're expecting, um, if they never used it and they weren't informed it was going to burn a little bit, they may, of course, get very concerned. So um, definitely a, a point of counsel for patients um, if you're prescribing this to them for the first time is let them know that uh, the alprostadil portion of this uh, may cause some slight burning, but it's nothing to be... Um, concerned about unless the burning continues to last for, you know, several minutes. So what do we do for females, uh, for the female sexual disorder? So we also have oxytocin, sublingual tablets, and we use this, um, you know, these are, this is a drug or hormone that promotes um, bonding and force, and we all know this, and um, can also help and assist in, um, you know, orgasm. Um, intensity and things of that nature. We have um, a hyaluronic acid, a DHEA and vitamin E gel that we'll use. And this is uh, provided in a pump that just pumps out about a quarter of a gram per pump. And the, and the, and the female can apply it. You know, this is daily uh, use. Um, this is just for maybe some vaginal dryness that the patient experiences. Um, the ones below, the sensitivity gel, those are the ones uh, that are kind of designed to be used, you know, before, during intercourse. And uh, they can get them with sildenafil um, or combine it with arginine as well to give a little bit more vasodilation. And then for, um, you know, the really bold, we can combine it with the menthol. And um, what that does is provide a little bit of cooling or tingling sensation as well just to enhance the sensitivity. Um, some women may or may not enjoy that and find it, uncomfortable, so we, we can uh, prepare it in uh, multiple different ways for them. So just to wrap it up before we get to questions, of course we just want to remind, re remind you that uh, erectile dysfunction does, you know, expected to uh, increase in the number of cases. It's a very prevalent problem as well as female sexual disorder. Um, these are often related to other conditions and may be preventable with non-pharmacologic therapy and lifestyle changes. So you should always look at the drugs you're taking, kind of consider, take all the whole picture into account. If somebody comes in with erectile dysfunction, of course, just throwing more pills at them without taking their account is, of course, you all know, not good medicine, and we don't want to do that, so we want to take care of our patients, and you can do that by partnering with a compounding lab that can provide several different alternatives rather than just the um, commercial products that are on the market. And we can individualize this therapy for every patient um, according to their needs. And that's going to maximize their satisfaction and make you um, out to be you know, their, their hero. So we, we want to be part of that and we want to help you do that for your patients. And um, we can do that by providing you information. So if you have any questions or inquiries, you can email them there. Just in the subject line, be sure to put A4M webinar, and then we'll get your, uh, your, your question answered, or you can always go to our website as well. But um, with that, that's the presentation, and I'd, I'd like to just spend the rest of the time answering any questions. This seems to be a, um, a time where a lot of questions get asked, because uh, this is a new for a lot of people. So I'd like to give a, a little bit of time uh, just for that option. So, if you'd like to just go ahead and type your question in the box there, and I'll try to answer it as best as I can. If, if I can't, um, I'll certainly get to it um, if you email it at the above email address. So with that, I just want to thank you for your time, and uh, if you have any questions, I'm here to, uh, to help you out. Tony, if you open the chat box, you'll see some questions. Okay. 
So <clears throat> I have a question about uh, the PPIs affect the female too. So um, right now that the PPI or the proton pump inhibitors, the studies that I've come across um, are only in relation to um, the enzymes that uh, produce the nitric oxide, um, you know, that's important during erection. I haven't found any studies that um, associate PPIs with female sexual disorder, but um, that's not to say they don't exist. But these are coming in pretty quick. I'm trying to keep up with them. Um, So a patient on Coumadin or, um, or other blood thinner, can they use the injection compound? Um, I think for this, this, you know, this would be important if they're, I really don't know if it's, I've never had that question asked, so um, if the patient, of course, is stabilized on Coumadin and everything is, and their, their, their values are, are stable, um, I don't, I would definitely recommend starting out with uh, a low dose. I don't think that there's going to be a, a lot of um, interactions with that. As far as all the literature I've read, there's never been any discussion on uh, any contraindications with anybody taking blood thinners of any type. Uh, can a female be given sildenafil or tadalafil? Uh, if it can, what is the dosage? Um, we have given, in the past, we have women taking five milligrams of tadalafil uh, daily, uh, um, along with, that's very similar to the males. Um, don't know if there's an established dose of the sildenafil. I think there's a female kind of product out there that kind of on the, on the market um, in, indicated for um, the female Viagra, but um, you know, we don't have any experience with that. We're not compounding that, but from the products that we compound here, um, I can't tell you that females are taking five milligrams of Tadalafil daily, um, and then low doses. I think I've seen up to maybe 20, maybe 10 milligrams of um, Sildenafil given to to women as well. So oxytocin, 100 units, is taken daily for female. Um, that can be taken, um, it doesn't necessarily have to be taken, it's not going to have a, I mean, if the, you want to promote a sense of well-being, the, um, the purpose of the oxytocin tablets for the females was mostly for um, prior, about maybe 10 minutes, 15 minutes prior to, uh, to, to sexual intercourse or sexual activity, um, just to promote their satisfaction um, during sex, their um, their orgasm experience, or their uh, feeling of um, you know post-sex feelings and things of that nature, um, it has been shown to kind of promote their feeling of um, of feeling loved and feeling uh, more affectionate toward their partner, things of that nature. Giving it daily wouldn't necessarily have any greater benefit than that. So the uh, question is, what is naltrexone used for? So there's a, lot, um, a number of studies out there um, with low-dose naltrexone. Um, the studies out there I think I've come across are typically going to be, I think, 50 milligrams is a lot of those in there, and those do have a role in um, promoting erectile function. But um, what we provide is kind of a, a low-dose 5 milligrams, and there's other literature out there that do, that do indicate that you don't necessarily need uh, the higher dose, so five milligrams of naltrexone certainly promotes uh, a feeling of um, uh, an amorous feeling, promotes uh, a sense of sexuality in women. Uh, for men, it does have a, a role in, um, you know, getting and maintaining an erection. And there's studies out there that I can supply that would, um, you know, give you that type of information if you if you would, would like to read those. So the average monthly cost for the patient, um, it really depends on how much you order for that patient. Um, I think uh, 
the questions on cost, you know, could be directed to um, to the sales team or to the email listed above, and they could give you a, a great indication of how much um, typical costs are. So, uh, how well does oxytocin work in relation to topical testosterone? Um, why didn't you mention topical testosterone for women? Um, that's certainly something that we do. Um, again, this this isn't everything that we provide. Um, we also provide many uh, orders for topical testosterone for women. That's certainly a, an option. Um, it's it's not an option for all women. Um, some women, you know, don't like the idea of giving testosterone. Um, others are contraindicated for use of any testosterone. Um, it's certainly an option, though. We do we do fill a lot of orders for that, and we see it quite a bit. So a longer question, um, I've never heard of many of these compounds, bimix, trimix, are these old compounds, natural compounds, and no brand name. Um, so bimix and trimix, just to give you a point of reference, these have been around and been used and compounded since um, around the 19, late 80s. Um, so it's been around for quite a while. I know I've been compounding it myself for uh, the better part of 20 years. So. Um, Dr. Ede and Dr. Goldstein are two of the oldest um, proponents of this. They have a lot of information. So Dr. Ede is Dr. EID and um, Erwin Goldstein. Um, those are two of the kind of the key players on uh, developing or kind of promoting this. And it became very, very popular uh, in the early 90s and into the 2000s. And it's been compounded for a long time. Uh, almost every compounding pharmacy that can compound sterile products compounds these, um, and they have different names for them. Um, we just call them bimix, trimix. There's, they're called triple P, ICPs. Um, there's all kinds of little names for them. There's no one standardized brand name since they are compounds, but um, they do have a history of use. Um, they're very, very effective, and they're very, very safe uh, in most patients if they're dosed right. So we don't have a compounded form of uh, the Fabanserin or the female um, you know, Viagra that we have. So we don't have that. There's, that's, of course, patented. We, it's hard to get the, the chemical uh, for that. But um, you know, when it becomes available, we could certainly make a variation of it. How early is the sensitivity gel applied before sex activity? So the sensitivity gel can be applied just before um, any foreplay or or directly before intercourse. Ba basically, what those sensitivity gels are are sildenafil and or arginine or menthol, and those are compounded into um, your typical uh, KY jelly base or KY liquid base. So these are um, the, you would use these as you would uh, any any other uh, you know sexual lubricant. Um, typically, you'd probably want to give it a, maybe five or ten minutes, um, you know, for the any drug effect that you'd want to use, but um, um, that would vary by um, by patient and their their sexual habits. So, how do you reverse the effects of bimix or trimix if you have priapism? That's a good question. Um, I should probably include that in the presentation for next time. Thanks for asking that. So. So yeah, so if you over overshoot or overdose your patient and you and you want to, you know, get them, um, you know, back down, what you do? Um, we also compound a form of uh, a phenylephrine injection, and um, the commercial product is I think 10 milligrams per mil, but the dose is about uh, one uh, one milligram. So we have a compounded form that's um, that's one milligram per mil, and typically of that one milligram per mil, you're you're going to dose. It doesn't take very much. Maybe at the maybe a half a mil. Um, of course, at the most, you'd want to give a mil just for the volume. Uh, but I've heard of people using the commercial products, uh, 10 milligrams per mil, and they use 0.1 mils. So um, while that's an option, it's it's very um, we don't see it as being very safe uh, simply because it's a uh, it may be difficult. Um, 
to pull up the right amount. Patients may get confused with 0.1, um, hopefully not, and then they would go and inject too much. So uh, we just have a more dilute version that's a little bit safer to use and you don't uh, have an overdose. But um, it does have an effect almost immediately, uh, and these are for, for cases, of course, where your erection is more than um, you know, four hours. So, um, so there's a question here about discussing the efficacy of intravaginal DHEA. Um, so the DHEA mentioned in here um, being applied, um, you know, either uh, externally or slightly internally. So there's uh, there's several studies on the use of DHEA and these uh, low doses like that that um, that do have um, some local effect on the vaginal epithelium, but they don't have a they don't produce any changes in any hormone levels systemically. Uh, we keep it at a at a relatively lower concentration, and um, the idea is to kind of apply it um, slightly, um, maybe a moderately every every day, every other day, once a day. Uh, are these safe with oral sex, or should it be wiped off? Um, I would say that they're, um, they're, they're safe. There's nothing toxic in them. Um, they would just be maybe unpleasant um, at, at best. So what women would be a contraindication for testosterone? So um, patients, you know, women with um, a history of uh, any type of cancer, cervical cancer, breast cancer, we want to steer away from that maybe. Um, estrogen sensitive cancer uh, looks like on here. Which estrogen does an estrozole prevent aromatasing testosterone? So testosterone gets converted into uh, estradiol. So um, you would, if if that if that was your question, so um, an estrozole would prevent your testosterone from um, being converted into that. So does the bimix or trimix work even with post uh, prostatectomy nerve damage? Um, I've had a lot of patients who had success with this. Um, they patients are post prostatectomy and it does work very well for them. Just the um, the trick is you you have to find what their what their dose is going to be, and getting there may um, may may take several attempts, but um, but it does have uh, a very good success rate. Yes. So controlling the duration of the erection is based on the dose. Is there a guideline? Um, just the guidelines that I mentioned above. You just want to start low and kind of titrate up. So start low and go slow. Um, and your typical starting volumes are, are going to be generally around 0.2 mils of the concentration that you select. Um, and work your way up to maybe 0.7 uh, mils, 0.8 mils at the most maybe. And then um, if that's not effective, you'd um, jump to the next concentration or the next available size, uh, something that's a little bit more concentrated, particularly with the uh, alprostadol component. Uh, what other questions? Um, So I don't see any new ones coming in yet, but yeah, um, the question is, can we get a copy of these guidelines and the dosages? Um, if you want to email that uh, email above and put A4 in webinar and then ask for those guidelines, um, they can probably forward that email to me and I can uh, send you a response back, sure.
So it's about 7.45, and um, probably about I have to wrap it up now, but um, I do want to thank you all for your great questions um, and your time, and um, you know, hope to hear from you soon, and um, you can always you know, contact that email anytime, and I'll, I'll be willing to, um, to send you an email back. Mm -hmm. And um, with that, just have, have a good night, and I uh, want to thank you all once again. Thank you so much. I want to thank everyone for joining us. I'd like to take a brief moment to highlight an upcoming pellet therapies course that we will be hosting in Hollywood, Florida on March 17th through the 18th. And we will be featuring your presenter tonight, um, Anthony Campbell, along with Dr. Kenneth Orbeck. This course will be a hands-on application-based and will highlight the latest research in pellet therapies. For those of you who are on the webinar this evening, we are offering a $100 discount off of the registration. Um, you will need to call me. My name is Lindsay, and my direct line is 561-777-6807. You can also email me at lindsay, L-I-N-D-S-A-Y, at a4m.com. Thank you.